prepared. Um, the, the topic is my son's journey. Um, my son's being, my type of science being mostly engineering. And I've prepared a couple of slides. Just, you know, I, I think uh, researchers, we are, uh, you don't feel like you're presenting if you don't have slides. So just keeping with that nudge of a researcher or a scientist. So I'll, I'll, I'll just prepare, I'll just present the couple of slides that I have, but I request that you guys keep um, questions, whatever questions you have. I think it will be better. I might actually take less than 30 minutes presenting. I think it will be 15 or 20. And then I think it will be more productive if we continue discussion guided by your questions. So I'll just present and then I'll, um, uh, uh, Ruth can uh, moderate the questions and then we can continue from there. And so I don't have to uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Gladys, as Ruth has said. And then in these in these couple of slides, I'll just give you my introduction into engineering, and that is that happened while I was growing up in Kenya, where I was born and raised. And then I'll give you brief intro or um, discussion into my PhD life in the UK. I studied at Oxford for my PhD, and then I went to the US for my postdoc, where I was at MIT for two years. And then now I'm in a transitionary period where I'm uh, super confused. And I think we'll discuss some of those things um, um, in, the, in the coming slides. And then uh, lastly, I'll just share some lessons, top lessons that I've learned uh, through my son's journey so far. So engineering or my son's journey started in high school. I don't want to go all the way to primary school because I think in primary school, just like many other, just like many of us, um, at that age, up to I think 14 years or 13 years, you you are just a young kid um, whose life is guided by guardians, parents, teachers, and I was like that um, pretty much during that time. And then in high school, I think is when the journey to engineering or to science really started, mostly mostly influenced by my brothers who who studied uh, STEM related. My brothers, um, I have four brothers. Uh, who I follow. Two of them studied uh, engineering and two studied pharmacy. And so these sons' journey started pretty much, I think, when I was in high school, just listening to their conversations and just seeing them enjoying enjoying um, pharmacy and engineering. And I thought it was really cool. Uh, but particularly, um, I didn't like biology. So I was more, I, I gravitated more towards, uh, I found physics easy. Yeah, physics and maths were my favorite sub subjects in high school. And I think that largely, informed my decision to do engineering and then even with physics i particularly liked uh, things that are or topics that i later realized were more of mechanical engineering levers machines and, and such kind and so that is where my journey started and then on the picture i think it's i i'm, I'm assuming it's on your right is um, one of the pictures uh, in my final year of uh, undergrad so after high school, I was admitted to Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, uh, one of the Sorry, universities. Sorry, Gladys. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's on my side, but your slides are not moving. Ooh. We can just see the first the first uh, page. Okay, I maybe I reshare. I'm not sure, but you can. Okay, can you... now they are moving. All right. Uh, so, but but you 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 were. Uh, I'm not sure if it will be. I wanted to have a full uh, full view. So I'm not sure if that will. Let me let me try reshare. Okay. Mm hmm. Um, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. OK, let me try. I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to make it full screen. So let's see if you, you are able to see with that. OK. Can you see it? No, it's it's still a uh, PDF. All right, uh, let me see. Um, I think I can just proceed. Then. Yeah, sure. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I, I wanted to do full view, but if that is not working, I think I'll just, um, let me do this. Um, yeah, we can see. Okay, now the... then I, can, I think I'll proceed as is. You can see this? 
Yeah, we can see that, yeah. Okay. So this is the picture I, I, I was referring to. This is a picture of me. Uh, many people don't recognize me in this photo on the left, but this was me first first week of high school. Um, and then this is me, I think you um, um, here at the middle, um, we we were visiting a uh, thicker power plant uh, as part of industrial vi visits to encourage us or rather to expand our minds and just to see what is happening in industry and connect to what we were learning in school. Uh, so Ruth, please let me know if you lose uh, sight of my slides again. Sure, sure. I will. <clears throat> so uh, I think I'm taking you guys through my SARS journey. And so after after uh, Jomo Kenyatta University, uh, studying mechanical engineering, I got interested in the area of thermofluids. We call it thermofluids. So actually, whatever happens in power plants, most of that uh, falls under the mechanical engineering field of thermofluids. And particularly, that's why I like this picture, because it's a very good introduction of what was going on in my mind in my final year of undergrad and just the, the things I really liked. So we were, I think, eight. We were in a class of about 50 something students, but eight of us, uh, these guys here in our lecturer, uh, so eight of us chose thermofluids. So I was one of the guys who chose to major in thermofluids. And then um, 2014, November, while I was still in fifth year, I applied for the Rhodes Scholarship and then um, and then I was elected as one of the two scholars from Kenya in 20, for the 2015 uh, academic, year, academic year. And so when I got the scholarship, I decided to I, I, I decided to look for a thermofluids related um, related project. And because I, I, I don't know what um, I don't know if you guys are doing masters or PhDs or all kinds of research, but um, I think when you are planning to do a PhD or you're preparing, like there's just a lot of things in your mind uh, with regard to uh, preparing a proposal. And I remember being super confused and yeah, I, I did not know what the proposal was supposed to have or even how to write it, how to draft it. And I just remember writing an email to a professor. Uh, so Rhodes Scholarship, you have to take it at the University of Oxford. So that kind of um, forced, not really forced, but kind of just made a, an automatic decision that my PhD was then going to happen at Oxford. And so I just went to the engineering uh, department on their website, and then I checked uh, thermofluids projects, and I found a thermofluids professor there. So I emailed him and told him I want to do a PhD in thermofluids, but I have no idea what kind of project I want to do. And even I have no idea how to draft a proposal. And um, he was like, don't mind, let's have an interview just to see if you can manage a PhD. So that was, I was in undergrad, um, and someone had told me I can do a PhD without a master's, so that's why I was I was pursuing or exploring that route. So when we had a we had a call, um, he guided me. We drafted a proposal, and it was accepted by the uni, and I was given admission. And so that that began. Or oh, um, so 20, 2014. It was still 2014 December, I think. Um, when we were applying, and then around March of 2015 is when I got, uh, or was it February? Is when I got admission uh, to Oxford. And so that that was like the beginning of my PhD, uh, my PhD journey. And during my PhD, I was researching. Um, so I, 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 we were not using Kenya Airways, uh, but I'm just using it as a, cause it's our national carrier and just being patriotic. Um, anyway, just to show where the uh, aircraft engineers uh, for those of us who are not in this field. So the, under the wings of an aircraft, you will find sometimes a pair under each wing. Sometimes it's just um, one on each side. So that is the engine that is responsible, the red thing there, responsible for carrying you from one, um, one end to another. And I think you guys, I, I was seeing in the news the other time in the US, there were birds um, knocking engine and, and then a fire happening there. So without the engine, really, you can't go anywhere. So it's super important. It's like a heart. It's like the heart of the engine, I want to say. And we were, so when you open, when you open this, um, this uh, engine, which is enclosed in a drum like casing, the intestines of it will look like this. This is obviously simplified and it's beautified. Uh, if you look at the real things, like obviously grease and oil all over the place, but just simplify, simplif it's simplified. And 
it has so many components, I think over 30,000 individual components, but on the mechanical side, that is where I was coming from, um, having trained as a mechanical engineer. So on the mechanical side, we have four components. Uh, the, the, the first part, um, which I think when you, when, when you are boarding plane, you can actually see it, is the fan side, and then a compressor, and then turbine, uh, sorry, um, compressor, and then we have combustor, and then turbine. So anyway, the, I don't want to go into the detail, a lot of details, um, but the, the, the turbine section, they have uh, this kind of um, blade-like, bl blade, uh, blade-like or cup-like structure, open cup-like structure, and they, they rotate. Um, and then while they rotate, they generate power that now is responsible for uh, like powering the engine or giving us power from the engine. And my research was looking at a particular way of cooling. So they get super hot. We are talking of 2000 degrees Celsius. Um, normal, on a normal hot day, I think we have what, say 30 degrees Celsius and it's really super hot. So you can imagine how many times that 2000 is, like how many times, 100 times? more than 100 times. So super hot uh, environment and, and, and it, it, they run into danger of melting if nothing happens or if we don't do anything about it. So uh, my research was looking at this particular way of cooling um, that uh, that helps to cool the turbine blade. And then when they are cooled efficiently, then you can actually push it further. And by, by pushing, I mean you increase the temperature and that temperature is directly proportional to the power you get from the engine. So every time, um, if you can cool this efficiently, then you can increase the temperature and directly increase the power generated from the aircraft. Um, Anyway, so that is what I did for four years. And February 2020 is when I, I defended in December and then I had some corrections. I think many people who've gone through the PhD journey will understand or will relate. So I had some corrections to make, to, to pictures that I, um, I had in my thesis, um, to some things, uh, minor corrections, which I did, I think, uh, over two, two months. And then February of 2020 is when I officially was um, I officially was done with my PhD, and then um, the year before uh, 2019, I think this process actually started in 2018. I applied for Schmidt Science Fellowship. Uh, for those of you guys who are in their PhDs, they only take PhDs after your PhD. It's a postdoctoral research fellowship. If you want to, if you are tired, I don't want to say tired of your research area, but you when you do a PhD and you research something for over four years, it gets to a point you feel like you are starting to plateau in terms of how much you are learning or your contribution to the field. And that is what I was feeling um, towards the end of my PhD. We are just, just tired with the, um, you know, the way PhD can take you in, in a roller coaster. And I was craving to just learn something new. And around that time, uh, like perfect timing, uh, I saw uh, Schmidt Science Fellowship advertising for PhD students who want to step outside their PhD area and, and study something different. And it was perfect timing. I applied and I got it. And that took me to MIT. Um, so they sponsored my two-year postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. And I decided to just be crazy and learn something totally different, something new I had no idea about, and that is satellite uh, stroke rocket fuels. And once again, I was feeling like a first year PhD student, learning new terminologies in the field, learning, um, I mean, they are still in aerospace, but they are they're really different. Whatever I was researching for my PhD was qu quite different from what I was researching for my postdoc, but they had they had some similarities and some skills I gained from PhD um, or just doing research, you know, grit, uh, just patience, uh, failing experiments and learning to fail quick and all those things. They, they were super helpful in terms of helping me learn super fast and at least make some contribution to this new field. So the problem, we it's still an ongoing project, super exciting, um, and it's the potential of using candle wax, just a normal candle. Uh, the candle wax has a propulsive power, I, albeit small, but I think with more research in the decades to come, um, they, 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 they have potential, uh, promising potential that they can be used as uh, satellite fuels initially and even rocket fuels later maybe. 
And then the closest cousins to candle wax is the beeswax. And this is even more exciting because then it's more when you think of um, rocket fuels or satellite fuels, um, if you are powering your satellite or if you're using fuels from uh, byproduct of bee, bees, uh, bee, bee product, honey production, then I think it's you're getting food on this side and then uh, the byproduct, you use it as a fuel. Um, it's 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 very encouraging. And I think they, there was also a parallel research. I think it's still ongoing. Some researchers were taking bees to International Space Station and just checking if they can survive, if, if they can produce honey while they are up there. Um, and and, um, and yeah, so just just like thinking ahead of time and thinking uh, while we prepare to go to moon, to go to Mars, uh, we need to be more. We need to be self-sustaining while we are out there. We cannot rely. We cannot rely on the fuel from from Earth. Um, and so it's 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 really exciting in that in that sense. Um, um, yeah, so this is this is the research that I was doing for my postdoc, and I just included this link. I'm not sure if you guys can copy it, but if you can't copy, I can send it to, to Ruth and, and she can share. For those of you guys doing PhDs, I think, I'm not sure if, the, even masters, I suppose, um, there is this Harvard uh, website um, that should, that gives a long list of fellowships and grants that you can apply, and they've made a very nice a very very nice summary the name of the fellowship or grant and then they tell you deadline and they tell you who is eligible so you can just like scroll through and you can quickly identify uh, what fellowship or grant uh, you can uh, qualify and you can try to apply if you are interested now i think this is important and i think ruth had um, told me to talk about mental health while doing your sons um, or research, and I, I thought of mentioning that life outside your research or outside your science or outside your lab is very important. Uh, talking this out of out of experience. So personally, while I was at Oxford, I was playing for. Um, uh, so this picture is um, this is recent. I'm playing for a team uh, in Boston. Um, it's called Side Side Chicks. Um, Sidekick, sorry. Um, and, and I was I was playing. So during my PhD, I was playing soccer for the uni team and I was running. So this picture here, uh, you can see me uh, competing at the varsity games, um, which is mostly just uh, between Oxford and Cambridge. And I think they were pretty much big deal. I'm not sure if they still are, but they were a big deal. Um, and, and somehow I did all these things just because I had passion for that. But when I look back now, I am super grateful that I continued I continued pursuing my out of the lab activities. And for me, they were mostly sports related because um, I, I don't know if you guys experience but sometimes when, when experiments or when your research is not going as you plan, you feel super useless. And then it can definitely get into your mental health um, and it can affect your men mental health. Um, uh, many, many, many times the, there were many occasions and I write in, in the book uh, that Ruth mentioned, um, many times when experiments were not working, I think for almost one year, I was, I was not producing meaningful results. And I think for those of you guys doing research, you understand. And I felt super useless. And sometimes I would feel mini depressed, I think. I would just sleep during the day. And then evening time or afternoon, I'll, I'll receive a call from one um, from um, our captain for soccer. And she'll be like, Gladys, we need you. We don't have a number seven. I play number seven. We need, we need you. We need to win this game. And we need you along the wing. And I would feel super important. We'll go to would go to that game, and I'll give my best, and then we'll win, or even if we lose, but just being out there with other people and just distracting yourself, it really helps. So whatever it is outside your lab, whatever hobby you have, I would encourage you to continue pursuing, so that on the days when the research is is letting you down, at least you have something to lean onto in terms of just motivation and just to feel as a human being that you are contributing to the world and to add just yeah that you have another life outside uh even even aside from just hobbies like they can um they can they can be 
they can be a if at some point if research is not working if the hobby grows and it's giving you money it could be something you can continue pursuing i think but anyway there are just a lot of a lot of advantages of trying to to um, embrace a hobby and and try and pursue it and develop it so mostly most of my out of the lab activities were sports related but also took chance um, opportunities to travel this is one of the trip uh, we went to the group of guys uh, we, uh, it was one of the um, a trip I, I did, um, and I really enjoyed traveling. So, if chance, if you have a chance, I would say maybe try. Um, yeah. The, also, this is this was a picture after matriculation. I just ex excited to start the PhD journey. Okay. So lessons. I have. I think I have four lessons. Uh, number one lesson is, and I think you anyone doing research understands this, that inspiration is perishable. And I don't think it's only in research, I think even outside research. And my advice is um, just know that inspiration is perishable. And when you get inspiration to do something, maybe to start uh, to start a hobby, um, you make sure you start as, as soon as that inspiration comes. Because if you wait for tomorrow, you sleep and you wake up the following day and the inspiration is gone. Um, a very good example is when I... Um, I, I knew I was going I was going to write about my my PhD journey or my science journey um, and then inspiration came and I drafted something on a Google Doc and then I, and then life happened I was writing that book while I was doing my my postdoc and then I had so much on my plate and after some time I just lost I just lost um, morale and I wasn't I wasn't going to continue with it but the the thing is I had made um, I had made an agreement. I signed an agreement, and I paid some money um, to the to the person who helped me publish. And so they kept writing emails. When will I get? Um, when when are we meeting to discuss timelines and things like that? Um, and so when I look back, um, um, it reminds me that always you have you have so many inspirations. They do come, but if you wait for too long, they disappear. So when when you get inspiration, just make a make a plan. Make a plan to commit yourself so that you can't go back on it. Um, that applies to research and I think applies outside research as well. Number two, and I think this is also super, you can relate with this, is imposter syndrome is a norm in, as a researcher. Uh, we wrote an article with a friend of mine recently on nature um, and we were just talking about when you're starting your PhD. For me, I felt like an imposter for almost three years, I think, until one day I was sharing with um, a, a friend from the lab, someone I really admired. They were, I was someone I admired and they were almost finishing their PhD. And we were in these catch up meetings. I think we had taken a, a, a glass of wine and we were both relaxed. And, 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 and I asked her, I feel like an imposter. I feel like I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, I'm writing my thesis. I'm about to finish. I'm in my last chapter. And sometimes I just read my thesis and I don't understand what's going on. But I have, I just have, I have to keep going because my scholarship is running out, and I hope it will make sense at the end. Uh, so anyway, if you are in the early stages of research, this is just gonna happen um, for many different degrees for different people. But I think at some point, uh, at one point or another, you'll feel like an imposter. So my advice is just um, you have to create an immunity for it because. to make it not stop you from doing your research or stepping out of your comfort zone. So just know that feeling like imposter or feeling imposter syndrome and fear uh, while you do your research is common. And let, let that not stop you from stretching. Be kind to yourself is number three. Many things will be happening uh, in within within your research and outside your, your research. You are a human being. And um, yeah, sometimes you start something and uh, I, I like this picture because <laughs> sometimes you do research, you set experiments and then if you don't get results, you feel like I'm a failure and yet you've actually done something. You've, you've proven one way um, or at least you've seen that what, that way you, that one particular way does not work and at least you can try another one another way but just just be kind to yourself everyone fails although we don't talk about it a lot but we do fail beat yourself too much and uh, fourth one is a uh, grit develop grit because 
anything good. Um, I also like this picture because it gives a, a mental or a, a nice picture of just most, most successes are not straightforward. And um, even research, you know, you most of the time something will fail, experiment will fail, um, mistakes, obstacles and failures. But finally, you get to hopefully you get to where you are planning to go. And so you need that persistent, um, you need to be persistent and then uh, develop grit in within the lab and outside the lab. And then the last one, I added this because this is where I am. And uh, so I finished my postdoc last year. And while I was even while I was doing my postdoc, I kept sneaking to business school. Um, I attended one session at Harvard Business School. I attended a session, I think, at Sloan. And even at Oxford, I used to sneak to Said Business School to attend. I think I attended uh, some seminars. So just saying that because um, even while I, I say, uh, while I present about my son's journey, um, I think you guys will also agree that sometimes you have passions outside your science or something else outside your science or something else you want to pursue outside what you currently pursuing. Um, and I, it's, it's, I'm still in that transition period asking myself, do I want to go back to academia? I really enjoyed researching and I, I was, I was headed to becoming, I wanted to be, to be a professor. I think even the reason why I did my PhD, I wanted to be a professor. And then along the way, it's just been changing. And I think during my postdoc, I was just asking myself, do I want to continue with academia? Do I want to try something different? Do I want to go to industry? Um, and I've been um, I've been having this meeting with uh, uh, my uh, some of my mentors, a uh, lot of discussion anyway. But I think the main someone asked, someone told me that it's okay to change your mind because I was asking. Okay, so at some point I wanted to. I'm still thinking of applying to go to a business school or uh, exploring a startup idea that I have, and I felt that I'll be betraying my uh, PhD research. And I, I'll miss my research and all those. But anyway, they just told me it's okay to change your mind. It's not. It's not like you are betraying. You're just pausing and you want to try something else. You can come back to it. So just to, to close, to say whatever you are researching right now, if you if you have another passion outside, I think life is short. Um, and when opportunity arises, it's okay to change your mind and don't feel like you've made. Um, um, a forever decision to stay where you are. If you enjoyed this presentation and you want to read more about my story and most importantly about my PhD, how to apply scholarships and all those things, you can scan this QR code or you go to Amazon and just type uh, the PhD journey by Gladys Nyatich. I'm sure you can get a copy there. If you want to contact me, you can contact me um, on on these uh, social media pages or go to my website, uh, gladyschepkiru.com and then uh, you'll have a contact form there. You can uh, drop me a message. So uh, Ruth, I'll stop there and um, you, can, you can guide the Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, Gladys, for, for such an inspiring story. So if you have any questions for Gladys, uh, just raise your hand and then I'll single you out or you could type in the chat box and then I can read it out. So in the meantime, uh, Gladys, um, I personally have read your book, but maybe for those who haven't read, would you like give them a gist or like a summary of what the, what the book entails so that maybe if someone has other questions, they can get it from from the book. Okay. Um. So I, the book, in summary, it's about the PhD journey, and then it will give you the strategies for enrolling. So on the first the first few chapters, I write about my motivation for doing PhD for those who are considering, and then I interviewed. Uh, I think most importantly is just the thoughts and ideas from 15 friends of mine I interviewed and I added their ideas there in the book as well. So it's not only my ideas. And so I write about, do you even have to do this thing or commit to doing a PhD? And so that is one of the chapters. And then number two is if you do decide to do a PhD, it's pretty expensive. I think my, I think our tuition fee was 20,000 pounds per year. 
Uh, I can't recall, but it was just expensive. Uh, so you can self-fund if you can, but I think for many people, they rather apply for scholarships. So on page 29, if you get a physical copy, I list six websites where um, most of them collected from my friends. I would just interview someone and ask them, where did you get your scholarship from? And they'd give me their website. And so I collected those websites and then I... Um, I printed them out there on page 29. And then number three is once you are in the journey, how do you thrive? Because um, if you are in the journey already, you understand it's not an easy thing. It's a kind of a roller coaster. Today you are high and you feel so good about the results you got. And then the following weeks or months or even years, I think there were uh, close to one year, I was not producing any meaningful results and you feel super useless. You feel depressed. Um, so I write about Trip, uh, tips and tricks on how to to thrive to be to, to thrive during the journey. Um, things including, uh, like I mentioned, uh, purposely getting a hobby outside your your PhD just so that you feel like a, a meaningful human being. Sometimes, and even uh, I also write about um, I call it eating your elephant because a PhD I likened it to like a big elephant, and if you're given that elephant to eat on a plate, you'd be overwhelmed. But if you if you if you eat one piece at a time, you might manage it. So some of the tricks, and then the last the last bit of it, and I think the most important is I asked those fifteen friends of mine. I asked them three things they wish they knew before they started their PhD. And if you ask me, I think that is the most exciting, not exciting, but like insightful chapter. Um, just if you ask someone to, in hindsight, to, to, to say what they wish they knew, I think um, you get a lot of ideas. So that is pretty much what the book is about. Yeah, uh, so there's a couple of questions in the chat, but before we answer that, maybe one thing I could ask is how are you able to build resilience? Uh, because, you know, you encounter challenges from time to time from when moving from one from one phase to the other. So why, how are you able to build resilience and just yeah, maintain being at the top of your game? Two things, how I built resilience. Number one, I didn't have an option. So when it comes to my PhD, it was funded by scholarship, like I mentioned. And I knew many times, actually, I was on the verge of just giving up. And I think if we are in this journey, you will understand. But I was asking myself, what is that? I didn't have another option. So somehow, like if I, if I just, if I just, if I, if I quit, um, then maybe just go to industry and work. I'm not sure. But like, really, I didn't have another very attractive option. Uh, maybe if I had a job, a well-paying job lined up, maybe it would be easy to give up. But I didn't have anything really exciting um, else to jump onto. So that was number one. Um, number two, I think someone mentioned something very, uh, very insightful, that grit or resilience is like a muscle. And I think it is a muscle. And um, you don't build it, uh, you can build it in the lab or, or outside the lab. And somehow I think even while I was training, I was training for, for um, I was running 400 meter hurdles. And I write even in the, bo in the book that uh, I, I, I tried, I think, uh, three years, three years I was aiming to run under 64 seconds. I know that is for someone who understands the timing, that is a lot. But uh, for the uni record, like that was a massive, uh, it was a very good time. And I, I trained for three, for more than, yeah, more than, I wanted to count in months, more than 30, whatever months, uh, 24 plus 12, 36 months, just to, to run that time. And I think the resilience that I developed while uh, chasing that time in the field, I think it's the same muscle that when I went to the lab and things were not working, that that muscle is there. And so I just wanted to encourage and to say um, resilience is a muscle and it can be built. If you try something today and, it's, um, and, and you give up, next time you try again and you try and stretch, uh, keep stretching like that, and I think you you learn to have that grit or, or you can build that resilience. Okay, uh, so Hesbon says, incredible and inspiring journey. Gladys, what is next for you? Um, all right, so I don't know. To be honest, I'm not going, going to lie to you guys. I told you I'm in a transitional period, and I actually decided to take, I take, I, I took a gap year. Um, I think normally gap years, people take it after undergrad, I think. 
to just to travel and to think about what they want to, to do after undergrad. But uh, that ship for me sailed. And so I'm taking my gap year after my postdoc. Um, I'm almost running out of my gap year, but it's been super, super helpful. So I, I just traveled. Um, I, I came last month. Two months ago, I came, I came from my 11th country in, in one year, and it's been super, super, um, uh, super insightful and fulfilling. And I feel I feel my cup is refilling once more. Um, and so just to be honest, um, I, I'm considering a couple of options. There is a startup that I was also looking at while, while, while in this gap year. Um, uh, which I'm happy to chat more uh, with uh, if, if anyone is interested. Uh, so that is, I'm considering that. Um, I'm considering going back to um, do, going going to consulting. I'm considering going to research in industry. Anyway, just to say, I think you can get you can get it. I'm 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 I'm, I'm confused and I'm I'm exploring a couple of options at the moment. Sure. Uh, and then James is asking, my question is, what happens if you terminate your sponsored PhD program? Will oh, the sponsor James. sue you? James, you want to terminate? I don't like <laughs> the sound of that question. But anyway, <laughs> I'll say for me, with my scholarship, if you terminate, I think you just terminate. Like, they just tell you goodbye. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. You've saved some money for another person. I'm not sure. But I think um, if it's too much, I think for people, I really... I. Um, I can say, I can say, um, I didn't terminate mine, or I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't. What's the name? Uh, pause. I did not. I didn't pause my my research. But I know some friends, super successful, who paused their PhDs, maybe to go on a maternity leave, and then they came back six months later or three months later to continue. Um, I know people, maybe they had uh, mental health issues and they had to defer for one year and they came back and they finished. So I just wanted to say, and I think I even, I wrote, so James, you can read my book. Uh, some of my friends, they wrote about their experiences and sometimes if you, if it's possible, or assuming you have a mental health issue or a life-threatening condition, priority, like in that case, you have to prioritize. Um, and 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 so, I want I wanted to say like there is no even with my advice actually or pieces of advice that I gave, it doesn't apply to everybody. And just to say, um, and just to say. Uh, PhD journeys, they take all sorts of forms and colors. Um, they are super different. So anyway, if for whatever reason, um, there is an, a priority in your life, uh, if you want to terminate, I would say to, to most importantly, the uni, the important people in uni and the important person I think is your advisor. I talk to them about the reason why you feel like you want to defer or you want to take a, a break. And then they'll, they'll ask you maybe to talk to someone at the department or someone at the uh, weather. Uh, but just talk to your professor, talk to your advisor, talk to people in uni and and, and explore options. I think many universities, they have options. Um, they have options for, for such a for when such a case arises. All right, and and then Brenda is asking. Also, thanks, Gladys. That's a very inspiring journey. You say dealing with imposter syndrome should uh, you should build immunity towards it. So, could you give tips on how you can build immunity? Oh my goodness! So, um, actually, on top of top of my is that what's the name of the person who asked? Brenda Mdoni. Brenda. Okay, so Brenda. Uh, 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 while like, while I'm I'm talking, I'm trying to pull out I'm trying to pull out um, something that gave me a lot of confidence, Brenda, about uh, imposter syndrome. And let me just read it. I'm gonna read. Um, um, so you you know uh, so something about imposter syndrome, and that's why I said I, I said for me it's really helped when after a glass of wine we were relaxed and and my friend. And my friend talked about the fact that they were almost submitting their thesis and they did not know what was happening. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm not the only one. And I think just that realization that it, it's not only you, that is, it's not you or your capabilities. It's just the way it's just the process. It's just it's just the way it is. I think it kind of helps to to isolate it so that you don't feel like it's you or, or, or the fact that you are incapable. It's just that the process and. Uh, the reason why it's it's not you and it's just the process, the reason why you're feeling imposter syndrome, it's not you, it's the process, like the process of learning. 
Um, Brenda, read more about, I, let me just read, um, looking for the right, it's called Four Stages of Learning by, who is this person? Four Stages of Learning by um, uh, Abraham Maslow, Four Stages of Learning. And the first stage, the first stage is unconscious incompetence. And I think that is where, um, so if when I was thinking about my PhD journey, that is where in undergrad, when when I just, I don't know, I just felt like, you know, this doctorate thing, I'll handle it. And then I jumped into the swimming pool uh, because I did not know, I did not know like how massive the thing is. I did not know how it will make you feel like an imposter. Um, so I was in an unconscious incompetence stage. And, and they said, this is when, this is when we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and, and I think that is really beginning, before even you start a, a particular research, you, you idolize it, you romanticize it before you start it. Um, and then you now start getting into conscious incompetence. And I think after six months uh, researching what people have researched uh, or doing literature review, you are like, oh my goodness, this thing is big. I'm not sure even how I'm going to add new knowledge in this area. Um, and this is a phase where we are aware that we don't know and then you start feeling a great dose of imposter syndrome. And then you go to conscious competence. Now, towards the end of your research, after one year, two years, you start know, you start uncovering things you did not know before. You've searched for answers and now you know um, you, know you are competent. Uh, anyway, Brenda, read more about those four stages of learning and, and just know that imposter syndrome is mostly because of that, uh, because, because, um, because of that learning, learning process. Uh, it, it brings imposter syndrome. And I think knowing that it's not you, it's not your capabilities, but it's just it's just a process. And that's why many people feel uh, feel those feelings. I think that helps. Okay, and then we have a final question from Nabwira. Hi Gladys, it seems that you have mentors around uh, you that have been instrumental to your journey. How do you start and maintain these relationships? Asking as someone who is introverted and struggles with this. Mm, nice. Um, so yeah, someone was asking me who is my mentor um, and I was thinking a lot about it and uh, I don't have one one person but I, I do depending on what I want to get so like during this transition period when I actually talk about mentor I think you guys might be thinking maybe some professor somewhere um, but even someone who gave me more Someone who gave me more um, more light or more confidence, um, even to take the gap here, is actually someone younger than me. Uh, they just finished their masters, but I, I really like the way they live their lives. And so I think that is one way of choosing mentors. Uh, someone you admire, someone doing already, uh, they're already doing or doing life the way you would want to do life. Um, and I think talking to such people, they give you their um, they give you their thought process, or they um, they they share their stories, or their 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 uh, they share their stories, and and they give you pieces of advice um, just from their own perspective. So anyway, just to say, it doesn't have to be someone uh, way senior than you, but I think just someone you admire uh, in in career maybe. If you want advice from career wise, maybe someone already in that career that you are thinking of doing. Uh, but um, to say, like, how do you as an introvert? I, I think I'm an introvert. I'm not sure. I think uh, my friends say I'm extrovert, but I think I'm introvert. But you can you can look for um, you can look for someone even you. I think there are many I'm trying to say, like, there are many ways. There are many ways of, of landing mentors or getting mentorship from people. Uh, but I think for me, my rule of thumb is, this is someone, um, they know me, they know me like, um, um, they, they know me as a person. Um, they, they, maybe they've had some interactions with me. Uh, and mostly, that's why most of my mentors have been people in my life, uh, my friends sometimes. So the, the friend, like I mentioned, the friend um, who I talked to before I made the decision to take the gap year. And then it's mostly been, uh, well, like, during my PhD, it was mostly my advisor. Um, and then, and then uh, so career-related mentorship, I want to say. So they've been mostly my teachers, I want to say teachers and my, and my, uh, and my professors. Um, so how to how to how to get to, to them? Just you can just email them. But I think it's good if they already know you quite a bit, and then you can email them and ask them for. Um, I think telling someone be my mentor 
gives a lot or is a lot is a I don't know, it, it kind of scary for someone to uh, to say, yes, I'll be your mentor. Uh, but no, maybe not necessarily using those words, but saying, hi, professor, so and so. I would like advice on this area or on this area. And then start building that relationship the way you would build any any normal relationship. Um, touching base, when you switch careers, maybe emailing them and saying, I've changed my mind, now I'm doing this, and things like that. And it's okay to change mentors if, if, if you feel like relationship or whatever they've told you, maybe it might not work in your situation, you try another person until you find a perfect, um, someone uh, with like perfect relationship with someone and you can do, uh, mental, you, can, you can be asking them um, pieces of advice. Okay, thank you, Gladys. Um, I think there's someone typing. Maybe if you could just unmute and speak up. Okay, James. Uh, so he says, congratulations, Gladys, on all those achievements. Is getting a scholarship by luck or what is usually looked at? I have I've tried to apply for some, but I have not been successful. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I think there is there is a gem study. I think there is a component of of luck and luck in the sense of luck in the sense of so the way I um I, I the way I see luck I don't see it as the 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 way you just like slip and then there is money raining from your ceiling and you get lucky and you get money. I think luck. Um, someone said luck can be created. So luck in the sense of you apply twenty, you apply for twenty scholarships and then one works out and i think uh, people will say oh my god you are lucky but then you try to create that luck by uh, planting a lot of seedlings that that kind of luck is what i wanted to to talk about so i think there is that aspect because for me when i applied before i got road scholarship i had applied for quite a number i even i think even i applied for shavening and i was not selected even i think there was even yeah so anyway just to say just to say, uh, planting many seedlings is one of the ways of uh, uh, ensuring that you you might be lucky. Uh, one can work. So if you don't have my book already, um, you can get it. Uh, go to page twenty nine and 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 check all those websites. I think I have I listed six or seven of them. Each of those websites I think has hundred or two hundred active scholarships at any given time. And then uh, try and try and try and uh, plant many seeds in that sense, like apply many. Number two is, um, I, I think some scholarships they are pretty they are pretty uh, strict. They are pretty strict about uh, you letting someone else edit your thing or read your essays and things like that. But even with that said, um, you watch YouTube um, people sharing how they are, they wrote uh, on Google just. Like just do your research to make sure. I'm not saying your 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 applications were not good, but I think some scholarships might be looking for. Um, they don't say it, but like for those people who've gotten it, they'll be able to tell you. Actually, call call or email some people who've gotten particular scholarship you want. Um, they'll tell you that um, the, the it's not written on the website, but uh, but um, this these and this scholarship they'd want you to. Um, to write it this way, or to present your to present these and these skills, they need they need they need to get this from your essays. Like they can really guide you. So I would say number one, um, plant many seeds by applying to many scholarships. And number two, before you submit any scholarship, look for an alumni, uh, talk to, to talk to them how they applied, what what's their what's their thoughts and and their experiences, and I think it can guide you in improving your applications. So that you, so that they stand out and, and increase the chances of you being shortlisted. I hope that that is helpful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and I think we also have additional links that uh, are on our GitHub website. We will also share that as well. Thank you so much, Gladys, uh, for your time and for sharing with us your amazing, inspiring story. I'll pass it over to Nehemiah if he has uh, a thing or two to say before we round it up. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to Gladys, our speaker today, for honoring our invite to come share your science journey. Um, we are very grateful because most of us are in a transitionary period 
as I'm applying for PhDs. I'm already in doing PhDs in different areas in different countries. So your encouragement and your guidance um, and your story is inspiring so that we don't feel like we are uh, strangers in, in, in the labs or in whatever we are doing. So, and I'm sure uh, some of us, we reach out when we want to know how to navigate some storm. So thank you again, and we would like again to engage more and more. And to everyone who has joined, thank you. And we will look to engage even further as we also looking to create this community where we share our stories and come together to encourage each other. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Cheers. My brain is tired. I just have to laugh at 12. I am nocturnal. <laughs> As in, you say uh, before 12. Before 12, yeah. Usiko. Before 12 midnight, so. I'm so shaky, so I'm going to be back. So I'm going to scan me. I'm I think. Lost it to a... I'm going to scan me, so I'm going to scan me. But anyway, I'm going to scan me. 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 What is happening? Kulikuwa na manuscript, nafanya ni nito aji, reviewers comment. Alafu kuna manuscript ya kala bile nafa kwa malizia ya hiyo. Ya, so umemaliza. Reviewers comment zimeisha, so tunasubmit leo. Ya Caleb, nimefikisha halfway. Aishi, inaende kiongeza, but itaisha tu. Naandika paragrafu, paragrafu mbili na kumbili. Uyandika paragrafu mbili unapumzika. Yes, nita nukwambiu. Ndika ta sentence mode. Eba hivyo kuandika ngumu. Writing is so hard. Doing doing the work is easy. Writing it down. When you are just here, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah. Yeah. You are not going to be a police paper. You are not going to be a police paper. You are not going to be a police paper. You are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Yeah, you are not going to be a police paper. Constraint regions, you don't know. Andy, I'm Colombian. And you come and Andy, can you see? Check, check. I'm going to ask you a question. Eh, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question.
arenesi kitu ni haraka hata ningekuwa nimemaliza nimeenda kwa yeah, easy yeah mm. jambo lile but i think hiyo ni easier than the i don't know Sini unaandika kuhusu the HPCs you guys have built ama no ah. it's not the HPCs like like kuandika prefer like to guide maybe research groups in resource constrained regions like what facilities or infrastructure they need to oh, set in place oh i see uh. yeah it's like uh, more of a review paper, a method more of paper. a policy paper. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm a good leaper. Nataka ni malizi yo paper, yo paper kwanza. Yo ni eke invoice yo kusia wote. Ha? Hmm. Si weke tu invoice yenda nge mbele uki maliza nga kazi. Nataka ni, ni eke ya kusia wote. Peka yote, alafu endile kufaya kazi. Andika hapo kwa invoice, manuscript, eh, whatever. Manuscript writing, na uitume yende. Mm-hmm. Yendo, Juhata mi niki andika, niki submit your invoice. Siku kwa nimemaliza mm-hmm. kuandika yu paper. Mm-hmm. Eh. So that wa processing pesa yako ukiendelea na kazi. Otherwise, bado wataendelea kukueka. Nataka kale baone evidence ndio. Nataka uja maliza hii na umalika kuseudu. Hata kale bada stress. Misi jibu na una, 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 una wari. Eh. Tumakuwa na kale buna stresses last week na the other week. Eh. Eh. Oh. Aledani mm. strike kuandika ju sleep. Eh. Eh. Mm. Oh, now I understand, Basi, where you're coming from. Yeah, so I'll tell you, I'm the kid you're sleeping. So, I'm taking a bad draft. Mm-hmm. And the luck from a draft, I put it in with your water. So, when mm-hmm. I plan to come to me, I need the draft. Next week, Friday. Hmm? Next week, Friday. Mm-hmm. Mm. Alafu, mm. uh, si Mubagi is scheduled for 9th. Yeah. Meaning we have to send the next post out. Because it's yeah. just Ilu... next week. We'll go make it again. We'll go make it again. So, I'm going to go to the next one. So, I'm going to go to the next one. We'll go make it again. I'm going to Posta ingine ni gani? Hiyo ni maikuwa last week. Yenye imekuwa na Opelua? Yenye imekuwa na Gladys. Yenye imekuwa na Gladys? Mm. Sini sawa tu. Bora, bora umechange sura yake hapo na jina yake. Juu hakuna wow. time saa hii. Alafu pia unaitaji time na kufanya hizo vitu zingine za Caleb. Ah, hiyo nita change. Hiyo nita ah? change. Hiyo nita fix, mande itatoka. Masande. 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 So, unataka kuibadilisha totally? Niteza ibadilisha color. Like, badile ya green, ikai white, ikai kalengi. Haya, sawa, sawa, basi. Unapiku ugali, nilukulizu ukacheka. Hahaha. Niko niko pa shule bibi hata. Pa shule. Kuliama mm. kwa kamali niko na nyisha. Siko si I am not working from home leo. Leo imebidi nikuje juu niko na meeting na supervisor at 2:30. Oh, in a few. Yeah. In a few. Oh. Alafu hii zi links basi mimi na zi confuse juu kwa nini. Sasa so, zimetumia me... link yenye Mm. Yenye uliko umeandika use this short end link. Mm. Kwa chat zetu. Oh, so yeah, hiyo. Kuna demo license ni mara mbili. Tens link. 
ni sawa sasa basi ukituma hiyo post ya mobegi utume na link yenye tunafaa tushare nayo ni hiyo hiyo tutume hiyo 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 short na ah ya sawa basi acha mkwache nilina kazi yenyewe mimi ni dijarisha hii meeting hapo ya 2:30 okay sijui nitakutumia pepa next week hapo wenesdo niambie kama anaandika matope Stop. Wewe wewe unaandika matope. You are one person who is eh naitwaje? Ah, kale bali niambia either na either na perform at 100 ama at 0. So <laughs> Yeah, so for you to share something I know it's already like good. Cuz wewe wewe you go with the perfection. Hi. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Wacha wacha tuione. Uh, But come on next week. Mm, bye. Aya. Sawa basi bye. Bye.